So I'm Forrest Glines. I'm a graduate student at uh, Michigan State University, and I'm giving this talk in the stead of Brian, who uh, could not come. He extends his regrets for not being able to make it to the symposium this year. So what our group is uh, involved with is galaxy formation, which is and galaxy formation is challenging because of the numerous complex physics, the high dynamic range, and the need to simulate large populations of galaxies in order to get the statistics to do the physics. So, but we, what we use Blue Waters for is to understand how galaxies evolve over the age of the universe and in extreme environments. So in this talk, I'm going to highlight two results from the group's usage of Blue Waters, which spans the entirety of the time that the machine has been on, and that leverage the capabilities of Blue Waters to study the extremes of galaxy formation. Right. So what has Blue Waters done for us? Um, it's been a very stable machine uh, with just the right computational capabilities for our research. It's had a very helpful and friendly staff for helping us resolve technical questions and problems. And it's provided numerous training opportunities for students. And as Brian says, he's very grateful for the support that they give to the next generation of computational scientists. So the Blue Waters Project has been incredible for us. It's been a lot of support. It's been great. So the, re the results that I want to um, highlight for Brian are twofold. They span the two extremes of galaxy formation. Number one is about the formation of supermassive black holes within the galactic centers in the most ex extreme uh, dense uh, portions of the galaxy cluster and explor explorations of the extremely diffuse region in the circumgalactic gas around them. Both required tremendous computational power and at the time these simulations were only possible on blue waters. So taking a look at each in order, first this is a, uh, I guess a cumulative paper of this work. So. These supermassive black holes, they exist at the center of all galaxy clusters, all massive galaxies that we observe. For example, here is a radio image that of the nearby elliptical galaxy M87 that was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. It has a mass of about 7 billion solar masses, and it's much bigger than our own, Mil our own Milky Way supermassive black hole, which is only 4 million solar masses. Now, there is a strong relationship between the masses of these supermassive black holes and the properties of the galactic uh, centers nearby, typically on the order of uh, thousands of light years, indicating that there is some tight coupling between the formation of the galaxy and the supermassive black hole. An additional challenge is that these supermassive black holes had billions of solar masses at, an early, uh, at early times in the universe. Um, according to standard stellar models, these, uh, these supermassive black holes would form with about 5 to 10 solar masses, and somehow they would need to gain sol billions of solar masses within a, quick within a short time period, which is not, is not possible through the, the normal, uh, I guess, the, the tradi conventional pathways. So one scenario that has been uh, explored by our group is the direct collapse scenario. <clears throat> which is where a, a huge cold glass, cold, uh, a huge gas cloud forms um, in the early universe where the fragmentation has to be suppressed through some mechanism so that enough mass forms so that it quickly collapses into a supermassive black hole with enough size to grow to these billion solar masses sizes. Um, so one of the simulations that the group conducted were the Renaissance simulations. And these were a collection of galaxy formation simulations from the earlier universe, simulated thousands of galaxies in a range of environments, with lots of physics, including POP3, stellar formation, metal and rich feet, uh, star feedback, radiation transport, exploring uh, photoionizing and photodissociating effects. And they continue to be a tremendous tool in exploring formation, early galaxy formation. So this movie was made by the NCSA Visualization Laboratory. It's a composite volume rendering um, where the blue is neutral hydrogen. It shows the cosmic web. The bright, bright white is photoionizing uh, radiation, which comes from stars. And the red and brown are gas that has been heated by this radiation or by supernovae-driven outflows. So what we, we took, the group took these simulations 
and we looked for potential sites of this direct collapse scenario into supermassive black holes. So the two requirements that we were looking for were halos that were massive and had not formed star and that had not formed stars. So these had to be primordial. They had to have a primordial composition with very few uh, stars, very few metals, excuse me, from the first generation of stars. They had to have lots of cold, dense gas, and it had to be collapsing fast enough to make that supermassive black hole via, via direct collapse. So within the Renaissance simulations, we found two candidate halos. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Um, so this, this plot shows the two halos that were the most promising candidates. On the top, we had the, the cluster with the largest virial mass, and on the bottom, the cluster had, that had the most photodissociating flux. This photodissociating flux was important because the photo, the photo dissociating uh, radiation um, disassociates this molecular hydrogen that forms within the gas, and that molecular hydrogen is the it, it rapidly speeds up cooling, which would lead to early fragmentation and not be able, it would prevent building up this large cl cloud of gas. So, yes. So these, these two regions were both irradiated by this photo dissociating uh, radiation from nearby um, clusters, uh, nearby star forming regions in purple. Let's see, yes, so the colors on the plot, the, the grayscale is the baryon density, the temperature is in red, and that's um, hydrogen, molecular hydrogen forming galaxies, but the metals purple uh, indicate, the metals are in purple which indicate star, uh, supernovae feedback which is supplying this photo dissociating radiation. So, yes. So one thing to note though was that although we found these two, uh, these two halos, this was extremely rare within the, within the simulation, about 0.1% had approximately the right characteristics. And these were the most promising ones. So the direct collapse scenario was still kind of rare. So here are the growth histories of these uh, halos. They were pretty interesting in that they, they start to grow super massively. Um, and looking at this, uh, this, uh, this dotted line shows the, the mass at which you would expect them to start fragmenting. But because they were growing so fast, they grew beyond these gas clouds grew beyond the point where they could form even more supermassive, uh, more massive gas clouds to collapse into black holes. So, and then looking at this, this is, uh, these are just some characteristics at the, of the two halos of the last uh, data output. And the, the one important thing that I would just want to note is that there was a tremendous amount of gas at the center of these halos, um, <clears throat> enough to enough to form these supermassive black holes. One thing that we didn't do in the simulation though was actually follow this collapse down to supermassive black holes because for that we would, need, uh, we would need to have GR in the simulation, which we weren't, we weren't doing at the time, but uh, work by John Wise um, at Georgia Tech, he, um, his group is working on simulations that could answer those questions. Okay. So sort of changing gears into the, the other interesting subject that the group tackled um, this was uh, doing high resolution simulations of the circumgalactic medium. So this is the, the diffuse gas that would be around galaxies like our own Milky Way. Um, these, gal these galaxies are interesting because this is where the majority of star formation is in the galaxy, where the most stars in the galaxy are in these types of galaxies. So what does the, what does this circumgalactic medium kind of look like? This is a picture that sort of illustrates what our own galaxy looks like if you could see this diffuse plasma around it. So the, the disk, the region where most of the stars are, forms a very small uh, volume of the whole galaxy where most of it is occupied by this uh, dark matter halo in which there is this gravitationally bound uh, circumgalactic medium. And the circumgalactic medium is constantly interacting with the disk, exchanging metals, energy, um, and being excited by supernovae within the disk and affecting star formation. So observations show that the 
galaxies have a tight correlation between the bulk observational properties of the circumgalactic medium and the, the mass of the galaxy. So the relationship is, it's not linear, which suggests that there's, there's a tight interaction between the stars in the disk and the circumgalactic medium. And in effect, the circumgalactic medium must act like some kind of a thermostat that regulates the galaxy. So what we wanted to explore were, I guess, looking, looking at typical cosmological simulations, uh, the, uh, the spatial resolution of many of these simulations is effectively Lagrangian in that it's resolved by how much mass is within a cell. So this is looking at what a typical uh, galaxy sim uh, cosmological simulation looks like where the, the disk right here is well resolved but out in the circumgalactic medium we don't have as much uh, spatial resolution because there just isn't much mass there. Um, the code we use ENSO though being a adaptive mesh refinement code, it gives a lot of flexibility in how we can define that resolution. And so we can, we were able to, we could force Enzo to spatially resolve the, the AMR mesh for the whole circumgalactic medium. We resolved it down to a hundred parsec resolution because this is where the theory suggested, uh, the theory suggested that we'd need this resolution in order to resolve any thermal instabilities. So it was very expensive, very computationally expensive, um, needed lots of memory. We could only do it on blue waters. So what did we find? So again, this, this, is, what, uh, it, this is a mass resolution plot of typical cosmological simulations. So where on the y-axis is how much mass is in each cell, and the x-axis is just where that cell is in relation to the center of the galaxy cluster. And this is in comparison with some other state-of-the-art cutting edge simulations at the time, where the, color, the colors are just uh, temperature. Looking at the, the highly resolved, spatially resolved simulations, we effectively had many more low mass cells. So this would, by resolving the circumgalactic uh, medium at this high spatial resolution, we, we resolved, we both resolved the, the disk at a high, um, spatial resolution and the circumgalactic medium at a much higher uh, mass resolution. These, would, these could potentially be difficult for Lagrangian codes that can only, uh, a Lagrangian code that could only uh, refine based on mass. So um, looking at two different simulations where the top one is with this forced enhanced refinement and the bottom one is a standard refinement, uh, the, the group found two primary differences. One in that the, this enhanced uh, resolution inhibited mixing of cold and warm gas. So in inhibiting uh, mis mixing of metal, rich and metal poor gases. So in effect, a standard, re a standard resolution simulation has, would have artificially too high mixing. The second was that the higher resolution allowed cold gas uh, instabilities to form, where at, in warmer temperatures, the, these instabilities just collapse. They just rapidly cool and collapse. All right. So observationally, we saw a lot of incredible structures within these resolved simulations. So this is a, get a slice of the gas temperature from this previous simulation. And this white line right here is, um, I guess, a test ray where we, we took a sample of what, um, I suppose, how, how might an observation through this galaxy look like. And so right here is just a profile of what the density, temperature, metallicity, velocity would look like. And these would be synthetic observations that you would see from the, that same white line, observing through that white line. So it's very difficult difficult though to do this inverse sort of problem. You'd probably require something using machine learning. And, but we're hoping to create a, a large library. As we, we go up to larger machines, we hope to build a large library of these kind of samples so that we could potentially do this sort of inverse problem in a statistical way. So, so that's, those are pretty much the, the two larger projects that we did with Blue Waters but also using blue waters to move into the, the exascale generation, we had, uh, I guess, two sort of primary constraints 
going from Enzo, looking, looking at Enzo's limitations. So number one is that Enzo doesn't scale well to um, past thousands of nodes. Uh, I suppose with the Renaissance simulations, they, it was really taxing the, the scaling capabilities of the code. Further challenge is that Enzo does not leverage the GPUs or any other accelerator architectures very well. And so going on to future machines for future codes, we would also have to address that. So from these challenges, we sort of went to two different projects. So number one was Kathena, which I presented on um, yesterday. It's just this conversion of uh, Athena++ using Cocos so that it could run on GPUs and any accelerator that we might need to run on in the future. So it was very fast. Um, it compares favor favorably well to uh, both the, the CPU code that we started with and GPU codes that um, do the same sort of MHD simulations. And we were able to perform, it was just under, just under two trillion cells updates per second on Summit, running on almost the whole machine. Right, and this code is publicly available. So the second thing, second project is Enzo E, which we've heard about today, which is a Charm++ sort of rewrite of Enzo, which um, uses a forest of oak trees uh, instead of the patch-based AMR from before, and it's, it's also going very well. Um, we're hoping to move into these sort of simulations in the future. All right, I'll leave the summary up 